Ramon is one of my favorite people in the whole wide world. <laughs> I'm going to let him introduce himself and tell you all his credentials, but there's very few people in this world that know both sides of what we do as sharpeners, going to the salon, selling shears, and sharpening, and also the manufacturing side of it. So there's, there's probably maybe about two or three people in the world that, that can say that. So I'm going to let you tell a little bit of your credentials, a little bit of your story, and then he's going to talk to us about selling shears. Very good. Uh, look, again, uh, Ramon Eichert, uh, who am I? Guy that lives in Fremont, Ohio. Why Fremont, Ohio? Fremont, Ohio was at one point the cutlery center of the United States. Why is that? Northwest Ohio's abundance of natural gas, hence Toledo, the glass company, known for glassing, of, of all the power of forging and so forth. So Fremont, Ohio also had Klaus Cutlery. They were one of the largest manufacturers of fully forged shears. General Cutlery, they made um, uh, kitchen knives, much kitchen knives, but meat processing knives, bayonets, Crescent Company blades. So Fremont, Ohio was the cutlery center. So why am I named Ramon? Well, my parents, German. I'm the fifth generation in the family business. Eicher, Germany, they manufactured professional beauty shears. There was also Eicher, they're still around, that make uh, cutlery knives. There's Eicher that makes flatware, Eicher that makes umbrellas. In any event, a long history of Eicherts, and then my dad one day decided, you know what? I'm tired of working with my dad and uncle. I'm going to come over to America to, to play jazz. He came to the States, didn't have a union card. Uh, he right away found a German, sat down and was grinding shears just to stay in the States a little bit. Then Uncle Sam came in and said, hey, you either join the army, get drafted, or leave the country. His cousin left. He stayed. He got drafted. Well, one thing led to another, and uh, he stayed in the States. He got hired by Klaus Cutlery. From Klaus Cutlery, he uh, set up an operation in Puerto Rico. That's where I popped out, hence my Spanish name, Ramon, uh, Ramon. And then he bought all the machinery from Germany, brought to Puerto Rico. Once that tax abatement quit, they shut operations in Puerto Rico, went back to Fremont. One thing led to another. He uh, bought a company called Fremont Shear Repair, which my mom ran. Politics came in, they said, you're either Klaus Cutlery guy or your Fremont Sherry goes great, I quit. Started importing from Germany, the Eichert Company, did well. My brother entered the, the system, started manufacturing for a company called Cutright, and they did industrial shears, poultry, shoes, and uh, so industrial shears. From then, we started trying to get Japanese style shears from Germany, they wouldn't do it. So we started manufacturing ourselves. Our first customer was Hikari and it's their own Indica series. So we started manufacturing beauty shears from, from ground one. I, I didn't bring it, but I, I have this great case where it shows how, when you, how to make it from every step up. And so when you make a shear, uh, which, which you can't anymore in the States, only because uh, really fine shears are 440C stainless steel, you can't get a 440C stainless steel anymore in the forging. America's number one in rolled steel, stamped steel, but not in forged. So back in the day, we'd get the forgings in the steel, we'd order it, it would get shipped at Schilling Forge, and it comes in like bars, it gets red hot, you get the dye, it comes in ka chunk, ka chunk, ka chunk, and create the individual shears, looked like a piece of gray matter, got shipped to Fremont, Ohio, we did all the soft drilling into it, and then uh, we set it out and got induction heat treated, got it hard, came back, and that's where the fun began, and that's where we did all the polishing, from making a piece of jewelry, from making a gray matter, to not so great, to, to shiny. And it was a messy process from inside the fingerings. At one point we had, I think, 45 people in the manufacturing process and uh, did great, loved it. And then we got offered from Oster to buy us. I'm like, oh, hmm, do we sell, do we not? So we sold to Oster. And then anytime you're an owner, you get a shelf life and you know you leave they, they don't want you anymore so Oster doesn't have a shear program i don't know they, the, the eichert name so i've been in this industry since i was 12 years old and i love it and i was telling uh, i don't know if it was uh jim or jason that our theory was always and and 
Same applies to stylus, that you can have a thousand chickens, or you can have an elephant, or you can have both. But we always believed in the thousand chicken theory, meaning that an uh, elephant, when it poops, oh, man, it smells bad. A thousand chickens poop, oh, also bad. But if you lose a chicken, you don't lose the smell. That was always our theory with customers. <laughs> and when Oster bought us, a very superior company, they liked the elephants. They didn't like the chickens. And I think that's why their whole shear program, it didn't, didn't mesh very well, went away. So that's what I do. And everything in my life is pretty simple. My life's simple. A lot of people don't know I exist, but I do exist. But I try to keep it simple. And so, same thing with shears. And there are a couple of things that my dad taught me, and one was the PPP rule. And then I, another alphabet, I call it the CCC. The PPP is, is crucial. And does anybody know the PPP? It's piss poor preparation. <laughs> piss poor preparation. If you start the day, you're not prepared. You know, you just, just don't go out. Just take a day off. PPP. The second one I call it CCC. You need, you need courage, you need confidence, you got to carry. And a lot of people, when it comes to sharpening, how, how, many, are, how many have done sharpening for years? Okay, I, I recognize. Who, how are the new, new people here? The new ones? All right. So here's the thing. And, and if you have a spouse, a lot of times you go, what are you doing? Well, I'm going to go sharpening. And a lot of times they don't think that, that, that that's a real profession. And what do you do? Oh, I'm a sharpener. There, there's no, no confidence in it because you're not more than a sharpener. You're, you're a dying breed. You're a guy that goes in and face-to-face and -face customers. You don't have professional beauty people. Reps, they're, they're almost gone. They're dinosaurs. They call it edge technology, call it whatever, but you're not just a sharpener. You're out there providing service. You gotta love it. And for years, I don't think my wife really took my job seriously. After we sold the company, I went out there and sharpened. Then I had other people in the industry that had shear companies. They go, they, they kind of look down at me, oh, you're a sharpener. I'm like, yeah, I am. You know, that's, that's what I do. So one thing with the, the confidence, go out there, tell people, you know, this is what I do, I sharpen. Because I tell you what, this industry is amazing, absolutely amazing. It is recession proof. It's pandemic proof. It's proven that. It's absolutely, you can go in, you have a skill, you can get up every day and make money. I had a cousin of mine that worked corporate and eventually he drank himself to death. He was a year, I'm 53. He died two or three years ago. And he got more and more depressed. because He says, you know what, if I lose my job, he goes, I don't know what I'm gonna do. He goes, but you, you can get up and make money. You've got a skill. So this industry is amazing, it's a skill, whether it's professional beauty, whether it's grooming, whether it's dental tools, vet tools, whether it's industrial sewing, whether it's knife sharpening, it's absolutely amazing. So do not downplay what you do, it's a profession, it's an awesome profession. So uh, the courage, the confidence, again, it's just do it. Another thing too, when you go in there, look good, you know, Get a nice haircut, don't smell, don't look wrinkly, don't look frumpy. Go in there, look professional, be consistent how you look. So, confidence. I've been doing trade shows since I was 12. And one year we're out in the West Coast Long Beach show and we, we had to hire somebody. We hired a guy named Alex. I call him Gay Alex because he was, he was gay. He was outwardly flamboyant, gay guy, loved it knew nothing about shears. So I kind of showed him around. This is the cheap, this is medium, it's expensive, and, and gave him the whole spiel. And at the end of the day, I was looking, he was killing it. I'm like, how is he doing this? He, he's never sold a shear in his life. So I looked over there. He was there, parked in front of the expensive shears, and he kept it simple. He kept it simple. He'd take a shear, right away put it in the person's hand. He goes, oh, look how shiny this is. Look how good it feels. And it's so hard too. And with just those shiny, sharp, hard, simple things, comfortable, people were buying it. And the thing was the confidence. He exuded confidence. I went over to him. I said, why are you selling these expensive ones? You have this. He goes, well, if it costs more, it's got to be better. So it just shows in your mind. And he didn't even have product knowledge. So that's confidence. You have to exude confidence when you go in there. It's CCC, courage of who you are, what you are, 
you're sharper, you're a professor, you're a sales guy. Next, uh, the courage is to go in there and show your stuff. Uh, finally, carry. Um, you know, you always need to carry. You always have to have a display case. Don't have too much. Don't overwhelm what you have. But when you sharpen, you can kind of see what they're using. The other day, I was in a salon, and I go to salons about, about twice a week. And it was a, a seven-inch shear, and I was doing it. I said, you know what, here, while I do this, I have another shear. You're going to love it. Take this, try this. So was I trying to show her a different style, a different size? I'm like, hell no. I guess you could put four. You could have courage, confidence, carry, and copycat. If they like a seven inch shear, show them another seven inch shear. And so I gave it to her and, and I said, you're gonna love this, try it. Gave it to her and after I got done sharpening, guess what she did? She goes, oh, I like this, I want one. Then the other goes, oh, what's this? Oh yeah. So not only did she love it, another one had interest, but this one wanted a six inch. So when you carry something, don't overwhelm. Carry maybe one or two styles maybe two sizes, three sizes. Keep it simple, otherwise it's overwhelming. Another thing, when you have a shear, know what you have and love it. If you don't love it, you're not gonna sell it. Like I, you have some that like this titanium shear and it's got really fat edges and it looks nice. The handles are even, maybe a little offset, but you don't love it, you're not gonna sell it. So if you have a shear, know something about it, whether it's, whether it's a family, whether it's uh, uh, Banica Shears. Say, so, you know, this is a great shear, it's proven. The family is amazing, you're gonna love them, they're Atlanta. The history behind it, know it. And then the shears I have that I love to sell, it's called a hook. You gotta have a hook. The hook is whether, let's say the shear has a bent crane handle. The hook is your elbow is relaxed, your shoulder's relaxed, it feels even feels like you're cutting with air. So that's a hook for that shear. Um, a hook with a swivel thumb. You know, a lot of people go, ah, I can't feel this, but this is great. If you have issues with your hand, you hold it, you think you're out of control, but the, the, it's gonna stay in an angle and your hand doesn't close all the way. It's so comfortable. Once you use it for a month, you're gonna love it. It's a hook. Another hook, offset, ergonomic. Your hand's natural. Say, hey, do you have problems with cramping? Oh yeah, I do, I have tired. Well, try this, you're gonna love it. So you have to find that hook. You have to find that shear, that point, and you're gonna sell the hell out of it. Now, in the Eichert company, we had one shear called the, uh, the Geisha 8315. We made the Geisha normal, offset. Then we just bent the handles and blasted it, called the Scorpion. That was the second mutation of it. The third, we took the Geisha, we cut it, put a swivel, that was the one, two, was it the one, two, third mutation of it. Uh, then we took the two top handles, made it a little longer, fourth, made the two smaller ones, made it butterfly. So we made six mutations out of we one shear. We made it in color and put the Banica name on it and oh, we, called it the prism. The prism, that was a, that was a seven mutation. Yeah. <laughs> but, so, I still have one of them. yeah. So it shows that you don't have to have a lot, but you can have the same type of shear and just love it. You have to have the hook. You don't have to have a million shears. You just have to have two that you love and a hook. Why do you love it? And then a history behind it. You just, people like that. Another thing too, if you sell something, a lot of times if, if somebody has a sharpener, I'm like, I'm sorry, you know, I'm, I'm fine. You know, you walk in like, hey, my name's Ramon Eichert, I do sharpening, and they think I'm coming in for a haircut when I find out I don't. You can see their eyes just drop. No, I'm good, I'm fine. I'm sorry, that's, that's okay. So what do I do before I leave? Either give them, obviously, a card for sharpening, but yeah, it looks like they're happy, they're sharpener, but you never know if you have a shear emergency, this is it, or you come in with something, well, hey, it's not a problem, I just wanna let you know, here, say you have a cape. I've got a line of capes, you're gonna love them, chemical capes, just to let you know, and maybe, maybe you have a flyer. Keep a flyer down there. So show something that if you know you're gonna go in, so rather than getting defeated and walk into a territory, and this happened to me, where I go into a town and I've learned that 25 calls, there's some guy that was there two or three weeks ago, or two or three days ago, or a week ago, 
it was a desert. You go in, you leave just oh, defeated. You walk away, go next one, oh, defeated. It just drains you. So try to do something besides, because you know what? You're not just a sharpener. You're not a sharpener. It's your profession. Show something. Whether it's a brush, whether it's a comb, whether it's a cape or flyer, and anything that you show, even whether it's your sharpening or a shear, you have to have a timeline. If you do a basic mailer, which I love, people just kind of, everybody gets social media, texting, all this crap, it's fine. But you know what's really effective? Make yourself a postcard with a cool professional, have someone do it, just don't do it yourself, and you know, have your face in there and, and eyes sharpen. Nah, do it nice, have a woman in there, or a grooming, or whatever area, or maybe have multiple cards, one with a little dog, cute dog, one with a fashionable person on there, and do a mailer. And if you do a mailer, say, hey, I'm gonna be in your territory, but give them a two-week window. Don't make it open, because if it's, if it's open, they'll get it, okay, great, put it aside. If you put a window in there, it's, it's called an action. Whether it's called an action sharpening, or if you have a special going on, or a limited time series, I only have X amount of these, and it's a time frame. So don't discount the old school sending out a postcard, because that postcard can also be your business card. You go there, psh, drop it off, rather than a small one, it's a big one, and you'll find that you'll, it'll go back in the back room where they do their, their coloring, or if they do grooming, you'll find it stuck on the wall, it'll go there. But again, don't just be a sharpener, you're not a sharpener. You're a salesperson, always have something. And, and if they don't sharpen, go, hey, you know what? Just to let you know, we have great shears, boom, done. Another thing, if you're new to the industry, you have to know key words. I mean, just it's, keep it simple. Um, wet cutting, what's wet cutting? Well, you spray the hair, you cut it wet, okay? Slide cutting, what's slide cutting? Well, you take it, you slice through there. Uh, dry cutting, what's dry cutting? Well, you, Cut hair that's not wet is dry, pretty simple. Uh, scissor over comb, what's scissor over comb? Well, you take your scissor over there and you cut and you cut it wet, you cut it dry. So you kind of ask them, well, what kind of cutting do you do a lot? Well, I do a lot of wet cutting. Oh, so you do slide cutting, slither cutting? Well, yeah, got a great shear for you. You know, then you have a very convex edge. They're sharp, they're hard, keywords. And I love this one because of the handle design. It's so light, oh, you're gonna love it. And so then you go that way. So dry cutting, what's dry cutting? Everybody says, oh, I got this special dry cutting shear. Well, it could be the edge. You know, maybe it's uh, when you're sharpening a shear and you polish the one side and you just don't polish the other one. That keeps a little burr. Great for dry cutting. You know, you can modify a shear to make it hold. And, and Bonnie, tomorrow when she does her class in sharpening, there's basic sharpening. You can tell, like, hey, if you do a lot of dry, and super cuts, they don't do a lot of work. They go in there, they take care of business and they, want, they don't want it to push. You give them a good slide cutting shear, 10 C is, it may after you know, a week or two or three start pushing here. Just kind of know your customer, know the basics. And it's not, it's not rocket science. And when you just throw out a word, all of a sudden you become the expert. You're not a sharper, you become the expert. And they think you cut hair. I've never cut, had a hair in my life, I have nothing. But I know shears. Again, you know the old adage, if you don't show it, you can't sell it. You can't sell it. But have something besides just sharpening. Don't leave dejected. Look at it as you're planting a seed. Always look good. Um, so we talked about the hook, uh, the belief. Believe in what you carry. I know that uh, Bonnie, they have Kasho, Japanese shears. Yeah, I was going to announce it. But what? That's a good time to uh, announce it. I'm going to announce it for you. Okay. It's awesome. Japanese shears, there's a hook. A belief, you find out more about Kasha, they got a huge history, it's a belief. You love it. Another reason for selling a shear, if you sell a shear, oh my gosh, it's so good because you go in there, you sell a shear for, let's say, 100 bucks, 150, 200, 250, 300, it doesn't matter what it is, a lot of times you're gonna double your money or more. It's awesome. So what do I do? I give them a one year, if you drop it, nick it, cut chicken uh, wire with it. UPS man runs over the truck, I don't care. First year, I'll come back for sure, for free. Either fix it, if I can't fix it, I'll give you a new one. Why do I do that? Heck, if I have to go in there and, and fix it for free, guess what, I already made my sharpening money off that one sale. So what happens when you go in there, A, 
they'll talk, the salons, whether it's a, a salon or if it's a suite of salons, when they say, you know what, I bought this shear, I dropped it, I knew I dropped it, I called him, he fixed it for free. They love it. Or if you're going in there, what are you doing? Well, I'm fixing this for free. Well, I, you know, another person, I, can you look, can you check my shears? The biggest thing is, can you tell me if my shears are sharp? So all of a sudden you went from selling to going there thinking, ah, I'm gonna go in there, I'm just gonna waste my time. I got it's a one year for free. Guess what, it's not for free. A buddy, so you need to find a sharpening buddy that's not in your territory because you know what, I hate competition. I don't care how nice you are, I don't like you. I don't like my competition. I don't want to hear about you. I don't want to see you. I'd rather just live ignorant. And I tell you, your life is going to be so much better if you don't worry about your competition. Don't care that this guy uh, in the beauty industry, at least in Northwest Ohio, is $30 is about the going rate. I've got a guy, he does $20 a shear or two for 30. I'm like, what are you doing? I've had to go in and fix the stuff, but you know what, he's, he's getting business from it, but it's terrible business, it's awful. And when I heard that, it just, it just makes my heart pressure go up. I'm like, ah, oh, I don't wanna do that. So don't, don't think of competition. Don't, don't worry about sharpeners. Don't worry about other people's pricing. Get your pricing, don't undersell, don't oversell. You kind of find in your area, I know California, they do $40, but California's expensive. Uh, Northwest Ohio, uh, I was 25 bucks for 100 years. Now I went to 30, which they don't, you know, they don't play. It's 30 is a good rate. So just go out there, do your thing. And don't think you're sharp, you're professional, love it. Um, if you have a spouse, negative spouse, guess what? You're, it's a job, it's a real job, it's a tough job. It's difficult, and I'm going back to have a friend to get up every day to go out there, out of your car, get your rejection back and forth is tough. So find a sharpening buddy somewhere to just call, hey, hey man, how's it going? And I've got a guy that calls me, he's like, ah, hasn't been a good day, he's been sharpening five, five years. I'm like, really, what? what's going on? He goes, I only made 300 bucks. I'm like, what? I go, 300 bucks is awesome. And I mean, 300 bucks is, is that's 10 shears. But this guy is kind of focused in the grooming. He's just used to making 500, 600, 750 bucks a day. And he was down on it, like, man, that's, that's great. Yeah, $300 a day is $75,000 a year. Yeah, well, that, I think at another time he called me and he made like 125 bucks. I'm like, you made 125 bucks that you didn't have this morning. So you need somebody to pump you up or you needed somebody to talk about the shitty day you had, the terrible customer you had, this person, I got that shear, I, I couldn't do it, I didn't know what to do. Guess what, you might get some hints, you'll get confidence, you need a sharpening buddy. So I'm in Northwest Ohio. If you're from Northwest Ohio, don't call me. <laughs> If you're from anybody out, anywhere else, yeah, give me a ring, I'll talk to you. I'll pump you up. It's like anything, just keep it simple, be nice, don't be weird, don't smell, look good, have <laughs> empathy, and do something more than just going and offering sharpening. Show them something and always leave something behind and leave a timestamp, a sense of urgency. Do you have to be technical with ACT? I think ACT is great. Um, everything's good. Another thing that's huge, make notes. Put it in a book that I went to such and such salon, such and such date, and then make sure that in two months you hit them again. Because if you don't, someone else will. If you forget, they will. And a lot of the stylists, they appreciate that you're gonna call them. And I've got customers I'll call every two or three months, say, hey, I'm just calling, are you okay? Yeah, you told me, yeah, oh, I'm fine, or oh my gosh, I was thinking about you last week, I've been so busy, please come in. So you have to be consistent, keep your customer base, you have it. The biggest thing too, I learned from Jim O'Donnell. He says you have customers, you have clients. Customers are loyal, they're loyal. They stay with you, sharpener comes in, they politely escort them out. Then you have clients. Clients, guess what, they're not loyal. If you go in there and they have a sharpener, you do it, you think, oh great, I just got the salon. No, you didn't. Because if you don't keep them regular, you don't call them, 
they're not going to be loyal to you. And they may never be loyal. Maybe they will. Maybe Jim says, he goes, I'm not looking for clients. I'm looking for customers. So a lot of these uh, clients, there's a customer or clients. Which, one's a, which one do you like, clients or customers? Yeah, but reverse, but it works either way. Oh, reverse? Yeah. So you like clients. Clients are the loyal. Clients are the loyal ones, and customers, you just don't use anybody. Customers use anybody. Oh. So you're trying to get your customers and clients, and part of that is that you keep them on a schedule make them feel important. Because a, a lot of the confidence, also stylists, they go, I'm just a stylist. No, you're not. And you have to tell your stylists, and if they're young ones, you congratulate them too about what an amazing industry they're in. I mean, they have to deal with people, deal with, with shears. Another thing too, another great thing, when you go in and do sharpening, and, or reconditioning, whatever you want to call it, or you sell something, use this line, the ladies love it, or guys, what your clientele, tell them, I just finished your shears, I love them, you're gonna love them. The thing is about shears, shears and people have personalities. Everyone's different, and your shears have personalities. If you have any issues, call me. Don't wait a month, don't two months, it's an important tool. So tell them that their shears have personalities. If they have an issue, call, because it's gonna happen. No one's perfect. You know, you, you can be the best in the world, you can be Jim O'Donnell, you can be Dennis Brooks, Guess what? Shears, shears get goofy. And we'll go more over goofiness and what can make a shear goofy, whether it's the climate, whether it's your hardware, whether it's your washers. There are different things that can make a shear goofy, whether how somebody shoves their, their thumb in the hole, gives more pressure versus just a thumb. Different, there, there can be so many things that are out of your control, it has nothing to do with your sharpening, that can make the shear personality change. So always go in there, and when you sell something new, tell them again, you know, it's a brand new shear, but shears have personality. So if you have an issue, call me, call me, call me. No one wants to buy a shear and go, oh, I just bought this brand new shear, I just dropped X amount of money, and it's cutting, it's folding, oh, it's terrible. So personalities. Use that when selling and sharpening. It, it's so good. Yeah, yeah, and another thing too, with the, with the, when the economy declines, you're gonna find people coming out of the woodwork sharpening. And they'll, they'll go out there, no offense to people that use twice as sharp, but some of them will use twice as sharp, freehand. They'll do Hanzos and they'll destroy them. So you're gonna get a lot of new people up there. That's why I don't, I don't like to worry about, it just, it just makes me nervous. So you're, you're gonna find competition coming up with a declining uh, economy. Yeah. I was just gonna say, Keep yourself out there. We had, uh, Elias and I were up in a uh, cold calls in a town we've never been to before. We walked into a groomer's stop and asked the young lady if she gave me the center chart. And said, well, there was just a girl here yesterday and she did these here and they don't work. She said, give me this. <laughs> Took them out to the truck and fixed her shears. And while we were there, I was, looking out the back door of the truck, and a woman comes by and says, you sharpen knives? Well, this cold call that we did turned into $85 worth of kitchen knives that turned around while we were doing the other scissors. Yeah, right on. So it's just, you gotta keep yourself out there. Yeah, another thing too, I love it with people, and, I, and a couple years back, people call me and say, Hanzo, they hate Hanzo. They hate Hanzo. I'm like, why do you hate Hanzo? You got anybody familiar with Hanzo? Hanzo shears? Yeah, they, they, they sell them for like uh, five, six, seven, a thousand, fifteen hundred bucks. And all they had, I, I've never seen a Hanzo rep before, but I hear they're buff. They're good looking. Go in there, like Fabio, which I met, he is good looking. But so the, all they do, all they do is sell shears. And they have the courage and confidence, but the problem is, I don't know what their commission, I have no idea what their business is, but I love, I love Hanzo's because they just made a $250 share look cheap compared to what they're selling. Because they're, they're, they're having to do payment plans. I guarantee you, after the first initial down payment, Hanzo's already made their money. The rest is just gravy. If the rep disappears, flakes on them, it doesn't matter. They made their money. Hey, the uh, rep has to go collect from the salon. Yeah. If that's they a, don't make their payments. Right. Another thing, too, is uh, Hanzo, they do their, their sharpening. I don't know how good, bad, or indifferent it is. And people are saying, no, I have my, my Hanzo. I'm like, that's great. You know, send them in. I don't know how long it takes them. But, you know, if you need somebody, I can do Hanzo. Hanzos are great. 
Uh, they're made in China, but you know, they're, they're a good cheer. I, I have no problem doing them, I love them. So there's no magic, and you have to tell people. You know, you, you, and, and also, if somebody buys a Hanzo, the worst thing you can do when you look at somebody's shears, I just bought these, how do you like them? You say, man, these are great, yeah, I love them. You, you pay a lot of money for them, that's awesome. Do not downplay somebody's shears. They just bought it, they put it in it, it just gives a negativity. And I'll even sharpen shears. When I see a nice shear, I tell them, these are really nice. And they love it. It's, give, them, give them a year and they're downplay the Hanzo because they'll realize they pay too much for them. Yeah, so don't ne never, never ne be negative on, on whatever shear they're using. Even sharpening. I, don't be negative on a sharpener. When they come in and it's a shitty job, I'll, I'll tell them, hey, you know what? Here's what I did. I added more degree, or the set was off, but now you're gonna love it. <clears throat> you don't don't downplay their what they did and the money they spent because then they're just like, oh, they're ruined, and that that gives you a negative thing. Always be positive. Don't trash your competition. Ignore your competition. Don't you don't even want to know who? Don't even ask them who they are. Don't you don't want to know their name. It's, it's see, you know, I don't even watch the news anymore. I hate it, and I'm so much happier. I talked to my mom yesterday. I'm gonna watch the news, half an hour ABC News. I'm like, why? I'd like to know what's going on. I go, how do you feel when you're done? She goes, I feel terrible. I said, don't watch it. So that's a just confidence, go in there, ignore your competition. And some people may think, I, 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 that's crazy. You need to know what your competition is doing. No, you don't. You know what your competition is? Your competition is yourself. Your competition is that you do the best you can do. Talking about competition, talking about other sharpers, talking about people that are annoying, there are people out there and they can be the best sharp in the world, convex guy. I'm gonna talk about this, this annoying French guy. And he does all the Hikari. What, what's, I don't even know French's name. I'm not even gonna give him, I forget his French name. I, I, I rarely think about him, but he does a really good job. He'll take a shear, he'll convex, he's taught by Hikari, and we used to manufacture for Hikari. He does a super job. And he thinks that we Americans, what we do, that we're terrible. We don't have the skills that he has, that he can train you, that he can do. Well, then you have in the other spectrum, you got what I call Bevel Bob. What's Bevel Bob? Bevel Bob, he doesn't do a true convex. Guess who the best Bevel Bob in the country is? Right here, I'm Bevel Bob. I love bevels. When we manufactured, we put, we had a, a convex, you know, but then at the very end, boop, we put our 40 degree, or depending 45 degree, depending on what it was, or depending on how the grind was, because sometimes these guys that do true bevel, sometimes you need it a little flatter, because if not, you get bevel bob, it gets really wide. But anyway, that, that's another conversation we can talk about tomorrow. But I'm bevel bob, and when we manufactured shears, why did we put that bevel on there? Because we used a jig, we knew exactly from the back to front what the angle was. There's nothing wrong with true convex because you, know, you can true convex it even though it's not the same. If you have a beautiful edge and the hone is just immaculate, it's gonna be awesome. But if you have a good bevel, guess what, good edge, it's immaculate. And then we can go even more theory of, well, if it's too wide, how does the hair after you cut fold? Come on, it's all bullshit. <laughs> you go in there, if it cuts well and it does well, so who's your competition? You are your own competition. You wanna make sure that whatever the testing is, and we'll go over testing, everybody has a different test. That's a different seminar of how do you test, how you know it's shear sharp. There's nothing worse that you test here, but you test on fake hair, real hair. Does it push? Is pushing acceptable? So your competition is you making yourself better. That's your competition. Forget about all these guys that, oh my gosh, you are not skilled because at the end of the day, what's success? That you can take a shear, grind it to nothing, polish it, and make it look like a Hikari? Or success is that you've got a great customer base, people love you, they're happy, they call you back, and you come back with money on the weekends, you can enjoy your life. To me, that's what success is. So again, a competition, forget it, you're your own competition. And with that, how can you tell if a shear is good? Can you, can you smell it? No. Can you lick it? No. What's that? Yeah. So how, how do you know? So you know what makes a good shear? 
whether it's a hundred dollars shear, 150, 200, 300, 500, 800 dollars shear, what makes a good shear is if they have an issue, who can they call? Who can they pick that phone up and say, I've got a problem. There's so many people go to trade shows and you've got a guy and you've seen them all, they have a table littered with shears. $99, $50, $75. Okay, I bought it. I bought these at a trade show and you've got to fix their crap and you do a good job as, as good as you can, but they don't know where to send it. They don't know who to call. So whether it's a Cacho shear, whether it's above shears, whatever, where can you call? So again, when you're selling shears, same like when you sharpen and recondition shears, you tell them this is a number if you have any issues. So yeah, it, you can't. You know, how can you tell? You can, you can break the shear, have it analyzed with, uh, you, know, you can send it out and find out all the different ingredients, which we used to do, because we had a modified 440C. What's, what does that mean? That, that's a great thing too. If anybody asks you, what kind of steel is this? Just tell them, hey, this is a modified 440C. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> most, most of them will just say yes, but if they go further, we'll go, we modify, because we put vanadium in there, molybdenum, we put chromium in there. Um, cobalt. Co co cobalt's a funny thing. So you have all these shears out there that say cobalt. What is cobalt? Cobalt is an ingredient you go in there and makes it very, very strong, very hard. And uh, I know that Joel has a beautiful cobalt shear, true cobalt. Don't bend it, they'll snap. But cobalt's funny. If you have a little cobalt, it does nothing. It's a window effect. You have to have a certain amount of cobalt. If you have too much cobalt, it becomes very brittle. But if you have a little bit of cobalt, can you call it cobalt? Yeah. You can also make a sponge cake. You put a little salt in there. Why don't we just call it salt cake? You know? Even though I, I, I'm not a cook, maybe salt does have something to do with it. But it doesn't matter what the ingredient is. But, so yeah, it, it's a bunch of bullshit. And you don't know. You don't know what's in there. But talking about that in steels, what, what makes a steel good? There's some steels that, that are very good. They, they last forever. I'm like, man, this is pretty good. And people go, oh, Rockwell. These are super hard. And that's what Gay Alex said, they're super hard. But what does super hard mean? You can have something super hard. And if it's too hard, it'll start flaking. And you may not see it, but it flakes and it dulls. You sharpen it, it flakes and dulls, and it's hard. Or you can have the temper down a little bit, which we did, and you have something called molybdenum. It's hard to spell, harder to say, but it's key, 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 because what molybdenum does, it gives it not so much a hardness, but a toughness. Because when you have that convex or fine edge, it's like a hard rubber. So you cut, and it kind of has resiliency. So that's what you say, you have a modified, 440C, beautiful. Some people want to say, they want to hear that you've got great steel. I'm like, I, I'm not a meddler, just my brother. If we were over here, oh my gosh, he'd overwhelm you with metallurgy and talk. I, I don't have that skill. I, it's modified. We, we put real good stuff in there. You call it proprietary blend. That's what Hanzo says, I think. Uh, I'm not, I, I, don't, I don't follow Hanzo. I follow me. I don't have proprietary. It's modified. How do I get? How do I get the um, stylist to want to pick up that shear with the hope that it's going to feel better and give a better outcome from what she's already using? Because some of them they got a stack of them like this, mm -hmm. so they're obviously a shear junkie, or they haven't found what they want. I think they're shear junkies, man. They are. Number one customer. Oh, I love them. I love them. I'm a tennis. I'm a tennis racket junkie. I uh, tennis rackets. I play tennis. I love tennis rackets. I thought you were Bevel Bob. I'm Bevel Bob too. <laughs> I, 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 I'm different. I'm Bevel Bob, but then when I play tennis, I love different tennis rackets. So that person, who knows? You, you just, but how do you? I, I guess the hook comes in conversation. Yeah. And they tell you what the hook is. Well, that's even better. That's why I said uh, one of the C's: courage, uh, confidence. Carry and copycat. That, that seven inch shear, I think it was a rocket dog, beautiful. I sold her seven inch shear that had a slightly bent down handle. I told her this is a crane handle, it's easier. And it's air series. Why do you call it air? Because the, it's, it's lighter. Guess what? It's not lighter at all. It's not light. But I told him it's light. It feels light, but it's got a good balance. It's probably just a heavier, heavier 
but it has good balance. You tell them it's light, it's light. So, I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. So how do I know if I walk over to the table over here and pick up the shear, how do I know what the quality is? Uh, you don't. The, the quality is, uh, I, I know if you go over there in Spanica, yeah. that if you have an issue, you can call them and get it replaced or whatever, they're going to help you. That's quality right there. So is, is the basic metal for, for shears is 440C? No, you, you have uh, like the Germans, they call it German steel, which is not as bullshit. Germans don't have steel, they get their steel from Sweden. They use a 440A. So then you have a 440C, you have different modifications. You have Hitachi steel, you got all this different crazy ass steel. And uh, again, who, who knows what it is. But I guess if you're a Kasho, I don't know what steel they use, but I would pretty much guarantee that if they tell you it's a X amount of steel and it's X amount of Rockwell, then yes. And you can go in there and say, this is it. So is, I, is, is the Rockwell, is that one of, one of the critical things to look for? No, absolutely not. Because I, like I said, you can have a really hard shear. And if you buy a shear that comes from, say, Pakistan, and they have a little kid that are holding one blade by his toes and the other one by his hand, and they have it on the forge or heat treating it, and they're taking in a like, like a forged fire. You can have one that's really hard, you have one soft, then eats in there. Um, or you can have one that say that the, 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 the temperament is great, and they're both super hard, but guess what? If they're too hard, they can flake, depending on what you're in there, and then the hardness means nothing. And we didn't have the hardest shears out there in the market. We tempered them down, but they were tough. So you have hardness, you have toughness. So rock quality mean means nothing. I have a customer that I heard made, used to make our Bonica shears back in the beginning, and I have a customer that has the shear that bought in 1997, right? Yeah. 1998. 1998. He's still using that same shear. Uh, you, you don't want that customer. And I'm the only one. <laughs> you don't want that customer. Go, go away. I'm the only Run. One that sharpens for him, but he doesn't give it to any other sharpener, so yeah. there's a lot of metal taken off. But I mean, they'll last, but. Yeah, now run for those customers. You don't want those customers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he, he's, yeah. yeah. His wife makes up for it, though. She buys shoes. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I had a, uh, a barber shop that we go to, and we sharpen everything. I was just thinking about barbers, but go ahead, yeah. So we go to the barber shop, and all the barbers in my barber shop use Hansel. Mm. Real proud, and it's like, cool, and we never heard of it at, at first because we didn't do shears back then. And so we started getting into shears and stuff. Um, I became a dealer for a bug. And I said, you know, hey, try these. He's one of the guys was thinking, ah, you know, these are, we're having a hard time with our sales rep. Mm -hmm. As a people person. It wasn't a shear person, it was a people person. Right. Or a people problem. I said, well, why don't you try these? And so he asked me, he said, why are these good? And I said, well, you know me. I don't know anything about cutting hair. I don't even like to get my hair cut. <laughs> I said, but feel. They feel good. They feel like a great tool. And I know that the company backs the product. Yeah. Okay, Bill, two right pair there. From me, and another barber brought one pair for me, just like that. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a gay Alex effect. And, and don't be afraid to sell the shear. And please, 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 don't, don't whore yourself out. Don't give them discounts right away. You know, a lot of people, I've had it, again, all these years of selling, I'd have somebody come up to me, and I'd show them right away the geisha shear. They look at it, fine, tell them, hey, this is a great shear, it's $150, and they'd walk away. I'm like, well, where are you going? And that's why we started modifying, because say, well, I'm looking for something better. They weren't looking for something better, they are looking for something more expensive. And the whole thing is with price range, if you have low, medium, high, 80% of people, Go middle. Like I, the other day, I was went and got myself a uh, a Butterfinger Blizzard. You got the little tiny one. You got a medium one. You got a large one. And I didn't know you got a really extra large, but I just saw the the small, medium, large. Which one did I get? I got the medium one. Just do this, and I don't know. I just go medium. So a lot of times pricing, but don't but don't start with medium. Don't start with low. Many times start with high, or don't be afraid of starting with the high one. Or just start with the one you love. That, that's most important. If you love it, you can convey it, you convey it. 
But guess what? Just in case you did buy some shares or you have product and you feel you're saddled, get rid of it. Even if you sell at cost or below cost, get rid of that crap and buy something you like. Get rid of it. If you can't return it, get rid of it. Even if it's a loss, because some money is better. Use that money and get something you believe in that you love. Because if you don't love it, you're not going to sell it. I used to hate barbers. You go to a barber and they go, and they go, hey, you know, this year, you know how long I've had it and look at it and like, it's a Simon or who knows what it is. And I'm like, you probably had this for like 40, 50 years. I did. You know how much I paid for it? I don't know, like 30 bucks, $25. They're still using it. And I used to run from them. I used to avoid barbers. But the new barbers, oh my gosh, you get all these tattoos. No offense if you've got tattoos, good for you, not my boat, not my problem. But these guys are hip, they're young, they're busy, they're rocking it. They, they, have, they don't have an appointment anymore, but they're using better tools. Like you said, they're using Hansels. Whoever thought barbers would use Hansels? So don't discount barbers now. The younger guys are hip, they want their better tools. They're buying Converse. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And they're also guys, they're even better than stylists because they make so much money. They're normally in every two months. They're almost like groomers. Every two months, hit them, hit them, hit them, because they're doing in 15 minutes, boom, 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 boom. And if they have convex shears, they need them done every two months. So make sure you put them on a schedule. Tell them, hey, I'll put you on a schedule. If you don't need it done, that's fine. But many times they're like, oh yeah, I need you right now, or I'm glad you called because I dropped them two days ago. So find your schedule, whether it's act, whether it's anything, whether it's a piece of paper, whether it's your calendar, that look who you did two months ago, is you have to know what your direction is. You don't want to carry a lot of inventory. Don't go crazy. Um, if it's capes, find some capes, keep everything small, because again, things will start building up and all of a sudden you get a car van full of crap. You're like, oh. So if you have, so so if you have crap, then just add it on. Yeah, that's what we put on the park. <laughs> so, yeah, just move it. So, I mean, I say that, but don't, don't become a full-fledged beauty distributor because that's not your business. Your focus is sharpening and selling, and you just want to go in and have something to leave behind. Sales and service. Right. Yeah. Boom. All right. Thank so, you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.